November of 2016, Doug Axe and I and 18 other scientists who favor the theory of intelligent design attended the meeting of the Royal Society in London. The Royal Society is the oldest and most august scientific body in the world. It goes back to the 17th century. Sir Isaac Newton was one of its presidents. They had the portraits of all these heroes of science. But this year, the meeting in late 16 was called by leading evolutionary biologists who realized that neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory of evolution that we all learn in high school and college biology courses, is in serious trouble. In fact, the opening talk of, the, of the, the conference was by a very prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist named Gerd Müller, who, whose talk was titled The Explanatory Deficits of, of the Modern Synthesis, which is a, a, a jargon term for neo-Darwinism. His talk described most, most poignantly the inability of the mutation natural selection mechanism to generate genuine novelty. He said the mechanism lacks creativity. It doesn't explain the origin of major morphological innovations, the origin of new form. Pretty interesting because you think back to Darwin's theory and th explained the origin of new species. He was explaining the origin of new forms of life. So you have leading modern Darwinists saying, theory's not getting it done anymore. The mutation selection mechanism lacks creative power to explain the most important things in the history of life. Does a good job of explaining the small scale variations the little finch beaks that get bigger and smaller in response to weather patterns, the, the peppered moths whose coloration turned dark and light and dark again in response to varying levels of industrial pollution. No problem with that. But explaining where birds and insects come from in the first place, or animal body plans, or still less, the origin of the very first life, we need a new theory, said these gathered evolutionary biologists. That's why they were there. Now, they were exploring many other ideas, not the theory of intelligent design that I'll talk about tonight. They were working within a naturalistic or materialistic framework. So they looked at a lot of other evolutionary models, evolutionary mechanisms. But at the end of the conference, one of the people who had been instrumental in calling the conference together, a science writer named Susan Mazur, who's written about the post-Darwinian evolutionary biologists, a group famously known as the Altenberg 16, said, that sadly the conference was characterized by a lack of momentousness. There were a lot, there was a, many very trenchant critiques of the established theory, but no real breakthroughs on new mechanisms that would provide some insight into where the creativity must have come from, where the innovation must have come from. Now, we didn't really, in the, that is we in the intelligent design research community, or movement as we're sometimes called, didn't really need the Royal Society conference to inspire us to think that there was another approach that was needed for, to, to look at life in a different and more fruitful way. But it certainly didn't help to have leading evolutionary biologists confirming many of our very same critiques. And so what I'd like to talk about tonight is the theory of intelligent design, a little bit of the background on the theory, some of its core arguments, and then talk about the future we see for biology when, it, when biology is informed by the idea that a designing agent played a role in the origin of new forms of life, that life is a design system rather than a system that arose through unguided and undirected processes. So it might be good to start first with a definition of the theory of intelligent design. Um, I'll be on a talk show tomorrow, uh, Adam Carolla. I mean, I'm a new guy I haven't talked to before. Anyway, they, he did a pre-interview, his guy did a pre-interview with me today and wanted a definition. Well, here's a definition. The theory of intelligent designs is that there are key features of living systems, and the universe for that matter, but we're going to talk mainly about biology tonight, not physics and cosmology. There are key features of living systems that can be best explained by the activity of a designing intelligence, not an undirected natural process such as natural selection acting on random variation or random mutations. And a corollary to that is that living systems look designed because they really were designed. When our opponents can do no better than beg the question, we don't think we need to, you know, what is the? Flog the dead horse? No, I don't think I got that metaphor quite right. Anyway. With a flagellum. With a flagellum. Thank you, Howard. Yeah. <laughs> Beat a dead horse. We don't need to keep making the, arg the same arguments over and over again. Doug has also expressed this impatience. Um, 
you know, why do we keep needing need arguing? We won the argument. It's obvious to anyone who's fair-minded. Let's now move on. We'd like to use these core concepts of functional integration or irreducible complexity or the idea of of functional information or what we call technically specified complexity. Let's use those ideas to start to make some discoveries. If we think life is designed, it ought to look different when we go and investigate it carefully than if it arose through a series of gradual, undirected steps or processes. One of the first predictions that we made in the intelligent design movement of that sort concerns something called junk DNA. Anyone heard of it? Okay. We got a lot of press right up to, I was writing Signature in the Cell, 2009, people were still talking about junk DNA and how it proved that Darwinism was correct because there were these big sections of the genome that didn't seem to code for proteins. And therefore, they must be non-functional. And therefore, that's the, the expected byproduct of that trial and error process that we, we Neo-Darwinians had expected, random mutations accumulating over time. Well, we thought, well, OK, we believe that mutation is a real process, and we believe that natural selection is a real process. But if the genome was designed, we wouldn't expect to see 97% of it not coding for being, being junk and only 3% being functional. We thought that the signal should dwarf the noise, not the other way around. And so we predicted that the non-coding regions of the DNA would turn out to be importantly functional. Richard Sternberg was at the forefront of the work on junk DNA. He was the guy that ended up leaving the Smithsonian under pressure, let's just say. Anyway, in 2011, a major study came out of the National Institutes of Health uh, called um, the ENCODE Project. And it confirmed what Sternberg and a, a co-author, the same James Shapiro I mentioned a, a bit ago, had been writing for years, Shapiro, uh, uh, Sternberg predicting it on the basis of ID, that the non-coding regions are going to have a function and it was a massive study showing that at least 85% of the genome is transcribed, probably more, probably north of that eventually, and that the, it's transcribed into, into various RNAs that have lots of important regulatory functions because the, it's not just the DNA, it's a, a whole complex hierarchically organized informational processing system. Uh, Professor Shapiro graciously acknowledged Rich, Rick, Richard Sternberg as, as the, the, the first one to have the insight that the, the non-coding regions would be functional. He says, though we have different evolutionary philosophies, I need to acknowledge that my, co my colleague, Dr. Sternberg, saw this first. He saw it first because he, he holds to the view that life is designed by, intelligent, by an intelligent agent. Now, let me give some other examples of things that we're now doing. We, uh, Doug and I have a colleague who's a brilliant Microsoft uh, architect. Uh, his name is Brendan Dixon. He's a tall guy, six foot five wild shock of Einstein hair. And when you talk to him, you think he's probably at about that level. And uh, anyway, he was writing code for Doug to simulate the gene expression system with a computer model. And he wrote 10,000 lines of co code for us. And one day he walked into my office and he threw a book down on the table called Design Patterns. And the software developers here will know what that is. I didn't at the time. And he said, very dramatically, I get an eerie feeling that someone has figured this out before us. And by this, he meant all of the design patterns that he was discovering in the function of the information and the way it was processed inside the cell, which he was now modeling with, with, his, with his code. And he then explained to me that the book Design Patterns was a standard operating or design manual for computer uh, developers, for software developers, and that a design pattern was a, an established method of storing or processing digital information. For example, uh, he said, and then he ticked a bunch of them off, but just for your benefit, one, one such uh, design pattern is the automated error correction. You know how on, uh, you have a spell check that you can run, okay? Well, the cell has all kinds of proteins as a, a good doctor, a protein chemist was explaining to me before the, uh, the talk started. 200 some proteins that are involved in making sure that the DNA is copied properly, and if it isn't, if something gets inserted that's not supposed to be there, there are proteins that come in, pull it out, and put the right nucleotide in there. So we've got automated error correction. We have hierarchical filing of information, said Brendan Dixon. We have nested coding of information, a, an advanced way of encrypting one message inside another. And he said, I get an eerie feeling that someone figured this out. And then he went into Microsoft talk, and he said, only it's like, it, it's, it's, it's the same basic design patterns only they're being executed with an elegance that transcends anything we've achieved. It's like an 8.0, 9.0, 10.0 version 
of our own, our own advanced uh, um, design principles in computer science. So one of the things we've started doing to take the design concept and run with it was we started looking for design patterns. Maybe some other ones are out there that we haven't found yet. Because there's lots of design patterns you can, you know, we know what, we, we know what software de designers do to process and store and, 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 and use information. So maybe there's some other ones out there. The scientist who's heading this up is, is a very prominent scientist, not in America, he's in Europe. He's headed a very large lab. He's working collaboratively with two other major groups in, in, in Europe. And um, basically, he's looking for what George Washington used to do. Remember, uh, well, this is a little book we read to our kids called George Washington Spy Master. If you send a message, he'd write out a nice innocuous message about, remember to, Martha, hang up the laundry on Tuesday. But if you'd start reading that same message one letter over, what, when, what biologists would call a change your reading reference frame, then there was another message. And that was the real message. So if you knew the, the, the cipher, if you knew the, the rule for how to read the message, you'd find the real message embedded in the message. And what this scientist began to look for, he thought, well, maybe there's some, if the cell was designed, and if we're looking for efficiency, then an efficient designer might build messages on top of messages so that you get a really dense information storage. So he started looking for overlapping genes in bacterial chromosomes. And he found that in every reading reference frame he looked, there, there are actually six possibilities, three going forward and three going back. He found multiple messages, genetic messages, that coded for other proteins. So this is just a stunning discovery. He, has a, an, he had an atheistic postdoc in his lab who was asked by people in an, an adjacent group, well, what do you make of this? They were actually having trouble getting the results published at first because people realized it's, it's hard enough to explain the origin of the information in just one reading reference frame. But if you've got messages layered on messages, you know how hard that is? I mean, by chance, you're going to get, because you start, if you don't get one right, if you try to change it and then wait, write another message, you're going to wreck the, the other message. So you've got to really think that through, how you're going to layer it and make sure all of them are functional. In any case, this atheistic postdoc was asked by other researchers, what do you make of that? And he just went, I'm rethinking my worldview, yeah. Anyway, that's one of our projects. And I've got a little, some pictures of, of it, but it's, it's a really exciting project. There's been some publications coming out. But we're actively supporting this financially behind the scenes, so I have to be kind of quiet about this because the, it will not help the scientists to have our support for him known. Here's another part of the information idea as a, as a, a guide, a, what, what historians call a, a, a positive heuristic, a guide to discovery. According to the, the Darwinism, every section of DNA that's functional should have evolved from some other very similar gene and from, in turn, some, very, uh, some other similar gene by a series of, of mutations. So you'd have lots of different mutational processes that would produce one gene, uh, would gradually change one gene to another. Now, if you think that the genome was designed, however, you wouldn't need that, you wouldn't think or require that every section of functional DNA would have evolved from something else. It might have appeared abruptly, or it might be discontinuous in its relationship to other information. When we write a book, we don't gradually change all the letters from some other book. We don't see a series of letters changing from Hamlet to Stephen Hawking, for example. Hawking wrote his own book and started basically from scratch and put things. So there's no homology, no similarity in the, there's maybe a little bit you could find, but there's going to be a lot of unique sentences in Hawking that you don't find in Shakespeare, right? So a design approach would expect to find discontinuity in, the, in, in, these, when, in these sequence comparisons, whereas a Darwinian approach would, have, uh, would expect to find continuity. So we thought, well, let's see. Let's go and look. So we've initiated a project on this, and it's turning out that these Non, these orphan genes are ubiquitously distributed across the phylogenetic hierarchy. They're turning up everywhere. Anyway, one of our big projects, we're automating a search right now. We have four key researchers, scientific researchers, and a whole team of programmers working on this, including some wizards in Sri Lanka that are just awesome.